The Holy Gospel, according to Luke. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother in law against her daughter in law and daughter in law against mother in law. Jesus also said to the crowds, When you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, It is going to rain, and it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, There will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, but why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord? Just when we thought that we had already found enough things to disagree about and argue about, Jesus decides this morning to add one more topic to the list. And it's something we thought that we already agreed on, peace, and at least the idea that Jesus wants peace or would like us to live in peace. This is discouraging. We already knew how hard it was to come to a consensus in our country and in the world on reducing gun violence or solving an immigration problem. And now Jesus takes away one of the one things we thought we had left that we could agree on, that Jesus has come to bring us peace. But no, apparently, at least according to our initial reading of this passage, as Jesus says, I have not come to bring peace, but rather division. We are shocked that our Lord would say this. I wonder this morning, though, whether what Jesus is really after, what he's really attacking here, is not peace so much as what we people have come to call peace, a sort of false or pretend peace that just papers over the problems in our lives or in our communities. Perhaps what Jesus is really trying to get us to do is see how difficult the task of peace building is and to get us to commit ourselves to that work and to see how he alone is the one who can give us peace. On this notion of the difficulty of peace and sort of the different sorts of peace that exist in our world, I think of the words of the pastor and interpreter of scripture, Martin Luther King Jr., who in his life and ministry distinguished between what he called the negative peace, which is the absence of tension, a negative peace that's the absence of tension, versus a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. And King, Martin Luther King, as he surveyed the country, concluded that as great a threat as the outright hostile people of the KKK and church bombers were, an equally grave threat to peace, he thought, were the people that he referred to as the moderate, who were content with a negative peace, that was the absence of tension, and who were willing to declare peace when there was no peace or look the other way. So this morning we consider as Jesus attacks the notion of peace, we consider the peace that we would long for in our relationships, our families, our church. The peace that we long for with God 
Is it a negative peace that is the absence of tension? Or do we long for something bigger and deeper, a positive peace, which is the presence of justice? Now let me give an example of how these different sorts of peace might play out in our world. A few years ago, I journeyed and tried to support a college student who I'd gotten to know in my church in a time of great division in his life when he was longing for peace. It was his freshman year of college, and he was divided far from home and his family. And his struggles began with homesickness and social anxiety, which led to loneliness and then depression, and ultimately being hospitalized with, being hospitalized with mental illness and forced to leave school. But this student described to me that as, as painful as this was, one of the most painful experiences and moments came from someone who in theory was trying to help him, but who he realized, or we might say he realized, the peace or the help that they were offering was really a negative peace, which was the absence of tension. This person in his life was the dean of students at his college who told him casually in a meeting as he was getting ready to leave that his situation really wasn't that big a deal and assured him, don't worry, you'll be back in no time. You'll be back with all your friends here at college before you can remember, in no time flat. And this student told me this was painful because he knew that his counselor's words were a lie. For one thing, he had no friends. He had made no friends in his two months at school. And he sensed inside the amount of work ahead of him that to, to come to a place of peace in his life would take a lot of time, was an overwhelming task. And so his counselor seemed to be interested in a negative peace, a peace of avoidance, a peace that was an absence of tension. Now, this story I relay came from a secular school, a pagan institution, we might say, from which we might not expect anything more. But I expect that if we are honest, even as we think about our Christian families or our churches, that sometimes we fall into cycles of this negative peace, which is characterized by an absence of tension wishing our problems away or avoiding them. And we sense that we have problems or longings in our lives, in our community, in our country, so great that mere niceness or kind words, we sense that that will not solve them. And so perhaps as Jesus attacks the notion of peace or false peace, Perhaps as surprising and jarring as his words are, perhaps we are willing to listen because we are interested in a positive peace in our lives. And so we turn to Jesus, or listen to him, and turn to God. And in fact, for many of us, the first moment we were open to the notion or idea of God came when we realized how hollow the peace that we might find in the world was. How, follow, how hollow and fleeting it might be. And so we listen. And yet Jesus this morning seems to possibly have, have overcorrected in his search for peace. That is, as angry as he is, and we might understand he is at this false peace, he seems to have overcorrected to a position of anger. And this, I think, is what we fear and why we're so often content to remain in, in relationships of negative peace or false peace, because we're afraid of anger. And yet Jesus says that he has come to bring fire to the earth, and how he wishes that it were already kindled. As if we haven't gotten the point, he goes on and describes just how much conflict we might expect in the world naming every family relationship we can think of, how there might be tension and division between fathers and, and sons, mothers and daughters, and down the line. 
Now these are painful words, especially for those of us who have experienced in the church or in our families that, that religion or faith has been a source of tension. And perhaps we too have experienced the anger or condemnation in moments, in, in situations with division. And so, as we hear Jesus' anger, we fear, we fear that we are caught between two, with, it, with two terrible options. We can, persist, pers- we can persist in a world of negative peace or false peace, that is the absence of tension, avoiding problems. Or we can be open and honest about them and be condemned and receive anger with the people who we have wronged or who have wronged us. And so we are concerned. But I wonder this morning whether Jesus has actually come to us with a message of peace, a certain type of peace, his peace, and Jesus has come to dismantle this false choice that we all often fall into between a negative peace that is absence of tension and this non-peace that is anger and violence. And Jesus, I wonder, may be bringing this peace to us with his very presence and his body. That is, God, Jesus, is God's representation, that God has fought this very struggle, this very longing for peace, and has considered these same two options that we humans have. God, looking down at us, at a world of division, looking down from heaven, could have practiced a negative peace that is the absence of tension, looking down, wishing us well, saying, I hope, good luck with all that. Or, what we fear even more, God could have looked down with anger and said, your situation is beyond saving. I'm just going to smite you with anger and violence. Yet God, because God is a God of peace, chooses a third way. And God joins us in our world full of division. Jesus comes down from heaven to be our peace. Jesus comes to bring a peace which is the only true peace. That is, peace that is truth honed through conflict. Jesus shows us that peace is truth honed through conflict. And in his time on earth, Jesus is told time and time again that he should fall into one of these two opposing camps. He should go through the motions, quiet down, stop pointing out the flaws he sees in people, and just get along. And he probably could have extended the years of his life if he had taken that path. He's also told time and time again by his disciples to just win, destroy his enemies through violence and anger. But Jesus rejects both of these deadly options. Jesus is peace because he confronts sin and fear with trust in God's peace. And in a world full of division and anger, Jesus suffers death and betrayal But God raises Jesus from the dead, exalts him, and raises him to the right hand of God so that we would know that peace is possible, that we would know that a peace exists that comes through conflict. And so this morning, maybe we need to revisit our initial interpretation of Jesus' rant and some of his words that seem so threatening. For example, this fire that Jesus speaks of, this angry fire that he wants to use to condemn, maybe it would be better thought of as a gentle fire, a refining fire as we sang in our opening hymn, a purifying and healing fire. Earlier in Luke's gospel, 
John the Baptist nod, gave a nod to this healing fire when he said of Jesus that Jesus would baptize us with the Holy Spirit and with fire. That Jesus would baptize us with the Holy Spirit and fire. Baptism, this fiery baptism that Jesus gives us, is an acknowledgement that we have problems and are not perfect. We have divisions in our world and our lives that can be solved only with a peace that comes from God. And Jesus, with his life, shows us that peace is possible. This morning, then, if we correctly understand Jesus' angry words, we are sent into the world in peace as baptized people. For the closing part of Jesus' message, his request, is that we would know what time it is, that we would know that we have been baptized. Jesus says that he has had a baptism with which to be baptized and that he's under a great stress until it is over. But now his baptism is over, and so is ours. And so our stress is over. Jesus has defeated death and saved us, his people, freed us to live with peace and joy. And so Jesus calls us to recognize that fact, to interpret the times, to live, to know what time it is, means saying that we live differently because we have been baptized. It means to realize that any conflict or problem we may have in our church, in our family, in our world, is well within God's power to heal and bring about peace. As we look around our world and communities that seem to best embody this peace that only God can give, one area where I notice them is in churches that call themselves Celebrate Recovery Churches. Churches such as Zion that host groups such as AA and Al-Anon, which meet here. To celebrate recovery or to see recovery in the world, it seems, is to understand this passage of Scripture and understand what time it is. People who have experienced recovery or recovered from addiction have experienced the false peace offered them by a bottle or a pill, the false peace of someone who pretends to be kind and pretends to care. They have experienced the anger and condemnation that has come in some some instances from their failure to be the people they might have been and experienced the anger and pain in their life. But they have found in recovery that conflict is a necessary precursor to peace. To be baptized, to believe in recovery and second chances, may make us very strange in a world that believes the only two possibilities in dealing with division are avoidance or anger. But this morning, we are called to be these unusual people who believe in peace, the peace which only Jesus can offer. Let me give one example of how unusual and bold and outspoken we might be to be people who believe in peace. A teacher of mine once told me a story of his longing for peace and an experience with division in his life. He was recovering from surgery and in the hospital. He was probably a bit cranky and his painkillers perhaps were wearing off. And so when his, prance, when his pastor pranced into his hospital room with a big smile and said to him, well, how are we doing? My teacher was not amused, and he responded, I'm hurting like hell. And he said, I want you to pray 
and bring the power of God into this room. And if you can't do that, I want you to leave. And so his pastor realized what time it was and did as he was told. This morning, I imagine that some of us are feeling just as weary and tired as this teacher of mine, who, with his words, was really just channeling uh, Jesus in this morning's passage. We want to say that we are hurting and divided. But Jesus is here with his refining fire, the refining fire of our baptisms. Jesus is the power of God in this room. He tells our anxiety, our worry, and our fear to leave. Jesus calls us close. He baptizes us, and he gives us peace. In Jesus' name, amen.